Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us for this special presentation on the last day of Mental Health Awareness Month. Today's program, Broken Crayons Still Color, is a conversation between author and educator Romaine Washington and the leaders of Healthy Heritage Movement, Inc., a health education and advocacy nonprofit created to target and address health disparities within the African-American community. And it is named for the free eight-week mental health and wellness program that Healthy Heritage Movement offers. My name is Katie Porter, and I'm executive director of Inlandia Institute, a literary and cultural arts nonprofit based in inland Southern California. Before we begin, Inlandia Institute respectfully acknowledges and recognizes our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kawia, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, the Inlandia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. A few housekeeping notes. This event is view only, so please post your uh, any questions that you have in the chat. Or, I'm sorry, in the Q&A box. And also, please do note that the chat itself is uh, disabled for this event. Um, there is also live captioning available via the closed captioning button at the bottom, the CC button. And also, please note that this event is being recorded. This Blacklandia event is part of a series of events initiated last year in response to the May 25th, 2020 murder of George Floyd at the hands of the police. As an organization centered around the power of words, one that values speaking up and speaking out, Inlandia made a renewed and public commitment to providing a space for people in the Black community to come together. And from that arose a Black-led, Black Voices steering committee and a new series of events, Blacklandia. Today's event, Centering Mental Health and Wellness in the Black Community, is needed now more than ever. And here to tell you more about it is Romaine Washington. Romaine is the author of two poetry collections, Purgatory Has an Address and Sirens in Her Belly. And some of you uh, may know her from her work as an Inlandia Institute uh, workshop leader. Romaine has been a public school educator for over 20 years and has developed a social justice curriculum available for free on her website. So uh, with that, uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome Romaine Washington. Thank you so much, Katie. I am really excited to have both Ms. Phyllis um, Clark and Ms. April Gillis here today. Um, I wanna first introduce you to them and, and then talk a little bit about my experience with Healthy Heritage Broken Crayons and then we'll go into our interview. Uh, Ms. Phyllis Clark, MBA, has an MBA. She is founder and CEO of Healthy Heritage Movement, um, which started in 2007. She was working in the community and she began to notice the statistics mortality rates for African-Americans with chronic diseases were alarming. This included her own mother who passed away too young from colon cancer. Ms. Clark says, everyone was telling us we were going to die and her question and prayer was, who's gonna tell us how to live? God answered back, you are. And there began the launch of Healthy Heritage Movement. I want to introduce now Ms. April Gillis. And Ms. April Gillis is the project coordinator for Healthy Heritage Movement. Um, she is, has a wide variety of professional experiences prior to coming to Healthy Heritage in 2014, which is when she started with the organization as a volunteer and program participant through her local church. 
Since moving from volunteer to joining the Healthy Heritage team, she has led a variety of projects, including the internship program and project Capable, a research project on chemical exposure to personal care products. This is partnership with three community-based organizations, California Department of Public Health, Safe Cosmetics Program, and UC Berkeley. She currently serves as the project coordinator for Broken Crayon Still Color Project through the Healthy Heritage Movement and the organization State Funded Mental Health Program. So um, welcome, Ms. Phyllis and Ms. April. Um, I need to tell you guys that I am so excited to have you here and grateful. I was a participant in the um, program, and this is how I know about it, for eight weeks in the fall, which was timely during the pandemic. It was perfect to have um, such a large gathering of African-American women first time in my whole life, and I've lived some life, first time in my whole life that I was in the company of so many African-American women having a conversation, several conversations on stereotypes and the impacts of stereotypes and the expectations and the burdens that they have on us and our mental health and keeping our say, ourselves healthy in mind, body, and spirit. And it was such a healing for me. I wanted to let as many people know about this wonderful program as possible. So thank you ladies for taking time out to join us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes. Um, I wanna start off with um, just a very basic question to let everybody know a little bit more about Healthy Heritage. Could you tell us um, what led to the creation? I know I gave a little bit, but what led to the creation of the movement and what needs did you see in the African-American women that were not being met that led to this movement? That's a really great and poignant question, um, Ms. Murray. Romaine, because it is really the foundation of why we are here and and actually why as me as an individual why i'm here today what led to the creation of the healthy heritage movement was as you um, stated earlier um, one of my positions that i had in corporate america i was sent to a lot of um, conferences and workshops and it was all public health base and i just heard all these just devastating statistics about african americans in terms of mortality and morbidity and me coming from another industry i really it was it was very, very um, surprising to me. I did not walk through life li living as if I was dying. I didn't know about that. And then when I moved into sort of like the public health spectrum, I learned so much and I said, okay, and then I saw the proof, the data. I mean, it, the, we are at the top all chronic diseases, we have really a high, you know, mortality rate. And it's due to a lot of different factors. I'm not going to put it on the community. It's a lot of different factors. So I said, so I just asked one day, so who's, so I'm tired of hearing every time I go to a conference, I'm hearing how I'm dying. So who's going to tell me how to live? And I prayed on that one night and then God woke me up out of my sleep and said, you are going to tell them. I said, no, I can't. I said, I have no experience. I have no money. I don't even have the time. I said, so how are we going to do this? So how can I help? And um, by the end of the week, the proof was in the pudding. And we had our first conference, Healthy Heritage had our first conference. It wasn't even an organization. It was a conference. And um, I said, okay, I would love to I pull together wonderful speakers, wonderful talent in terms of helping um, me 
put the uh, conference together, you know, collaboratives and so forth, a lot of other CBOs, community-based organizations, and we put it together. And I just said 50. Well, we had 800. <laughs> We had 800 come to our first conference and I said, okay, so what does this mean? <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> is this, this is what I'm supposed to do. And from the rest is history. And that was in the early 2000s. And we've been going since then. We have um, uh, offered programs to, we are a firm believer we're all Christians in our organization, and we're a firm believer of, of collaborating with the faith-based community because that's our walk of life. That is no where we could speak to the male, the female, the children, the entire congregation, and the leaders. And it's very, very important to us that we continue to send um, any messages and any opportunities that Healthy Heritage receives based on God, we'd like to pass it on to the to our, you know, our congregations and our members and so forth. So that's kind of how we got started, but it was also in a tribute to my mother who died, as you mentioned earlier, at a very early age. I was just 19, you know, beginning to live my life, and um, sh and I and I lost her, and I became lost, and um, she passed of colon cancer, which is a really um, it, it's a prevalent cancer in the African American community, but can be can be um, saved with screening. If you go get your colonoscopy or do a Cologuard or something like that, you need to do that because we can be saved, but it takes a lot of us out. And uh, today I know if my mother was going through it right now, she would be saved. But I didn't know anything at that age. I was just 19. Yeah. My brothers yeah. and sister, we were all in those that that bracket. And um, so when she passed, we did not know why. We didn't know the C word growing up. We didn't know, although it was in our family and it's still in our family. And everybody has to know their, you need to know what your grandma, your grandpa, and your, your um, family members pass from because it's gen a lot of it's genetics. So it's important that we understand and hear the stories, the griots of our family. We need to understand what they're saying. Don't just, don't just go let them tell you, you know, he, oh, he's okay. He got, she's got the sugar. No, he has diabetes. And there is something to do to take care of that diabetes to make it manage. No, he has heart disease. He No, he, he has colon cancer. You know, there are things that we need to own for ourselves, but we need the knowledge. And that's what, that's what healthy heritage is here. So that's why we started because I'm like, nobody told me. I, I just still today, I'm traumatized by losing my mother. I wish I knew more then as much as I know now. Yeah. I, she could still be here with me. So that's why we were started. Thank you so much for your um, openness. And um, I can see the impact that it had on you. From you expected 50 people and 800 showed up. How did you accommodate that? Um, that is such, a, and it really does show the need um, for information and um, so how did you handle that? Well, that's a great question. I was amazed. And I, I thank God for a wonderful team, the collaborations between the American Cancer Society. The, I mean, so many agencies help put this on as well, as, as well as small African-American businesses, business owners, 
they were a part of it as well. And the speakers, everyone just came together because I think and at that time in early 2000, it was just becoming sexy to talk about getting healthy yes. and get, living a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. So we were at the beginning of that. That's why join the movement. We were like one of the first agencies, it's everywhere now, but we were one of the first agencies that, that kind of used that mantra just join everyone else. And everyone was looking for education and knowledge. And they were also looking for people that look like them. And that's what we were able to do. I made sure that all the speakers look like us. I made sure that they understood the psyche and the mindset and the lifestyle of you know, of the African-American community. And I made sure that they didn't come and talk down or judge the yeah. community. Yes. Just to just give them knowledge. This is what you, this is the best way to be the best person that you are to be. Yeah. And then the next thing was, this is what you need to do to manage or improve or prevent. Yeah. So we managed it with a great team and we had everything so laid out. And the great thing is that we, we pro provided in an incredible um, lunch for everyone, free of oh my charge. Goodness. My goodness. Yes. <laughs> it was, and then so they could come and eat and feel free. It was... It was a wonderful, wonderful event. And I still get calls today. When are you going to have, it was called the Healthy Heritage Wellness Conference. And it ran for nine years. Oh my so, God. Um, and then that transition, did that then transition into um, Healthy Heritage Movement with Broken Crayons? Well, yes. Well, I'll tell you the conference, which was a conference, an event became an organization ah. because based on the conference and the feedback, we noticed that individuals needed additional services like resources, um, uh, you know, additional one-on-ones or, you know, they needed additional resources. So we just try to figure out what does that mean? And it also meant more workshops. So we started partnering with some of the counties like San Bernardino, Riverside County and um, the state and some universities and started providing workshops for the community. And that's really how the organization began because it could no longer just be an event, it became a resource for the community to find out, okay, I need, <laughs> I, I, do you know, uh, you know, a mental health specialist, or do you know a gynecologist, or do you know, you know, things yeah. like that, and that's how the organization, and then we had the opportunity to partner with, as I mentioned, some of the counties and so forth programs that were um, prevalent at that time, like Body and Soul, um, Fruitful Family. Um, and then we created a program called Living Life on Purpose, which is a combination, a, com uh, a combination of a couple of programs that we uh, supported, and it, it 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 involved mental health and physical health. So it taught nutrition, physical, uh, mental health, chefs, learning how to shop. It was really uh, robust, and that was also implemented in the church as well. Wonderful. And we also saw a need in, um, you know, just in the mainstream community. So we went out to beauty shops and barbershops and held um, workshops, healthy uh, lifestyle workshops. In our men's barbershops, which we loved, um, uh, <laughs> we were the, uh, it was the uh, 
black barbershop program, we uh, provided uh, diabetes testing in oh local goodness. barbershops in Riverside and San Bernardino County. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. I didn't know the scope of your services to the community. That is fantastic. And talking about um, the barbershops, um, you know, April, you have, um, that's one of your passions as I was reading your bio, talking about the chemicals and the hair. And could I, and you don't know what you don't know. And so I love that you're there to educate. Would you like to talk a little bit about how you came to Healthy Heritage and what you see manifesting? Absolutely. So one of the programs that Ms. Phyllis just mentioned, Living Life on Purpose, uh, was the first program that I met Ms. Phyllis through. So I grew up in the Inland Empire, but I went to school in Atlanta and I moved back to California in 2014 and I prayed, you know, I, after I graduated, I graduated from Spelman College and I went straight into corporate America, which was amazing, but there were some tools that I didn't have. And, you know, it, it just took a toll on me and, and just came to burnout. So when I came back home in 2014, I prayed and I said, Lord, help me get healthy what I didn't know <laughs> was what he had in store. And that was me meeting Miss Phyllis. I actually met her through our church, uh, her and another one of our uh, previous coordinators were at one of our events, our spring festival. And so I just had a conversation with her, had no idea who she was, told her different things that I had in mind. And she said, you know what, give me a call. I'm thinking, who was I talking to? <laughs> And so it was amazing to be able to start with her there. And the, our church was getting ready to go through living life on purpose. And I got to start volunteering with Healthy Heritage, but I first went through living life on purpose and it was answered prayer for me to learn how to get healthy. And I was able to, you know, learn for the first time that I had the power of choice. There were so many things that I didn't understand about what it meant to be healthy and through healthy heritage and all of the resources in the programs. I, like I said, I started off as a volunteer and became a coordinator. And I, I feel like I've been a student as much as I've been able to work and, and coordinate and to learn. I've also been a student and it's been answered prayer. And so what I've been able to see is really the manifestation of not understanding where I grew up and the resources that were outside of our community that never came through the doors of our church mm -hmm. or never looked like us. And so yeah. thankfully our pastor, while I was gone, had partnered with Miss with Miss Phyllis and had opportunities to invite her in to our church, which set the platform for me to meet her um, because he invited her in. He invited Healthy Heritage in. You know, my mom and different people in my family had attended the conference and I had no idea. So I didn't know what I didn't know. And so it's just been a journey. And then with Broken Crayons, it's just been another level of answered prayer, seeing the transformation of people and information and seeing how much it, it transforms your mind when you do it in a way and it's culturally relevant where the information is packaged where it looks like you and you feel like, hey, they're talking to me. Yes. That makes a huge difference. And that's what I've been able to see and feel through Healthy Heritage personally, as well as seeing the impact that we've been able to have in the community, especially through the churches. And because Ms. Phil's her vision was to work with the churches, Again, that gave me the opportunity to meet her there. Beautiful. Both of you guys have such a journey, such a story. And so Broken Crayons, I know you were um, meeting the needs, a lot of different needs. Um, I had a friend, She, um, we were talking about 
this event. And so she got the Broken Crayons book and she said, is this the book I need? And I said, no, hold off because this is speaking specifically to us. So we're going to go a little bit more into that. So as we're talking about mental health and we're talking about the African-American community and uh, particularly faith-based, would you like to talk a little bit more about that and some of the, um, I know I don't want to get too much into what we go into the program, but um, we talked about um, how we issue um, mental health in the faith-based community, how we say, oh, it's not that you have something emotional going on or something mental going on, it's that you're not praying enough, so that you don't have enough faith. And so how did that all navigate? Um, how did you navigate that? Well, you know, I will start and then and then April will jump in and uh, chime in on this. Um, okay, it, 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 I don't think it's not a secret that, um, you know, one of the foundations in the, the African-American Black community in America, in our country, is, in our community, is the faith-based community. Yes. Because it's the, it's the faith-based organization, the churches, because it actually helped us through the years, the really yes. tough years that we don't, I don't even have to mention the name. We all know what those were. Yes. And then we got through those years and then you, we had the other trying years to, you know, where policy laws, all of those were against us. So the church has always been there. It's been our refuge. It's been, I always say, you know, and I know you probably heard it too, there's a praying grandma somewhere. Even the worst, you know, we could have, you know, the biggest gangbanger on the earth, but his grandmother is praying for him somewhere because they're not born gang members. They're made gang members. They're made to be based on their circumstances and so forth. So, so we, we're, we're basically as a people, our culture is rooted in faith, in faith to a higher, higher power. I, I, I'm not, you know, some people call it God, some people call it Jesus Christ, some people call it whatever. And then we have this building that we've made in our communities that are called churches. And we go, it's open usually seven days a week, and we go several times a week to just breathe. Mm -hmm. We go to breathe. Yeah. We can breathe more today than we couldn't yesterday, but that w is where we could breathe and we could share our real feelings. And if we had to organize or get something together to try to, you know, help Rosa Parks, you know, we, we use those buildings and organizations to help that. So mm -hmm. it's only, and it's, it still continues today. It's only natural that we take our message to keep our community going. I mean, God bless, we survived 400 plus years. Yes of yes you know of, of yes. All, so I want to go I know I, I didn't uh, let me segue a little bit into actually okay. our mental health because we talked about we've had great conversations about post-traumatic slave syndrome and that's one of the things that you know when you're talking about the years and years of um trauma trauma that um, that is specific to the African American community, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we'll segue into that. But as an educator, one of the things I really appreciated about 
the program as I went through it was that I saw that you guys spoke to all the multiple intelligences. We had movies, we had music, we had poetry, we had art, we had discussion. And so it really allowed, um, and some of my areas were weak and others it was just my fit, especially the poetry, which we'll get to in a little bit. But I would love for you to talk um, about some of the aspects of mental health that we don't know that we don't know, perhaps, when we talk about warning signs and um, mental health checkups and uh, it's okay to not be okay, trying to destigmatize the concept that, that there is, that people do have mental health challenges and that diabetes, and they're as serious as diabetes, and some of the other things that you've mentioned that kill, and sometimes it, it aggravates and puts the things that um, we might have physically, um, it aggravates it to, and to manifest in a different way physically for us, the emotional and the mental um, health challenges that we have. Would you like to speak a little bit about that with, um, with the listeners? Sure. Okay. Do you want me to take that one or do you want to take that one, Ms. Phyllis? Go ahead and I'll jump in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, the, some of the things that you've mentioned about the early signs, you know, about, you know, destigmatizing, about being able to reach out for help. Ms. Phyllis says it all the time, especially during our class. It's okay not to be okay. Yeah. And I think it's hard because a lot of us have never heard that that it's okay not to be okay. And I think by partnering with the churches, one of the things that we've been able to find is that your faith and your and seeking mental health help does not mean you have a lack of faith. And I think that is something that's been very stigmatizing in the church for a long time or a conversation we haven't been able to have is that yes pray yes seek the word yes all of those things but also understand you know God made us a part of the body he gave us wisdom and he gave us wisdom through people as well and resources and so by going through this class and really some women feeling permission to say it's okay not to be okay we're breaking down those walls and saying, I'm seeking help along with my faith. And it's not in conflict with our faith. And I think that's that's a huge key that we've been able to see in destigmatizing mental health and having conversations and you know, seeing some of our our women from early 20s or even up to 80s having conversations with their family now because they're saying hey this is what was happening this is what i was feeling hey it's not just me i'm not alone yeah. and in our churches we gather that's our safe space but there's so many women and men and people suffering in silence because we don't know how to have a conversation or haven't been given permission to have a conversation about our mental health and not have it contradict our faith. And so through the program, through Broken Crayons, we're able to share and to help women see that it's not a contradiction, your faith, to seek help and how to seek help and how to find help that is relevant to you and that, you know, it's okay to find the right person for you. And, and we mentioned, you know, past trauma and different things. Some people have reached out for help and maybe it wasn't the right person. Then they stopped there and said, oh, it doesn't work, but it may not have been the right person. And so through the class, people are equipped with tools to understand how do you find the right help for you? How do you understand the, maybe some of the generational trauma that has happened different things that have, have taken place, even as simple as stress. And we talked about, you know, diabetes, we talked about physical health. We're whole beings. Yeah. 
Yes. And so we're not compartmentalized. So, and Miss Phyllis with, with the classes that we have, our other classes and with broken crayons, it's a compilation of, of being a whole person, you know, spirit, mind, and body. And I think that's one of the keys that we've been able to see through the program that allows women permission to seek help with our faith, not in spite of our faith. Yes, I like that. Um, and the church is a vehicle. It, you know, the church is a vehicle. And women, the church is usually filled <laughs> with mostly women, right? Mm -hmm. And women go back to their families and they're usually... In our community, many of them are the head of the household. And even if there's a two person partner household, there's one woman in there that's running things. So yeah. she is the person that we are educating on mental health to take it back to her family. Yeah. You change the woman, you change the children, you change the partner and you change the family. And that is our goal. Um, yeah, so for those of you who are listening, there is information in the chat. Um, if you need to reach out, um, there's information there. Um, I love that you are reaching out in the faith-based community. And as you said, it is pre predominantly, there are predominantly women there. And we bring it back and that helps to reduce the stigma and the shame that comes. And that was huge for me in the program to not just hear it once and not to just talk about it once, but it was a continuing theme. And every time you hear it, it becomes more comfortable. Um, and you're like, oh, it is okay not to be okay. Oh, it is okay to reach out. It is okay to suggest this. And so um, that was one of the um, things that I found that really ministered, ministered to me. Um, so um, how, what else do you see as a benefit of um, broken crayons and help the Healthy Heritage Partnership? Well, one of the things that um, I feel is a benefit, and again, giving you permission, is that we all know that we have to go to the doctor, our primary care physician, our healthcare provider, whomever that is, maybe annually for our female, our preventive checks up, check up our screening, we need to add mental health checkups to yes. that list. There's, it's no longer an option. It has to be a part of our lifestyle, like orange juice. It needs, we need to go, and we can start with our primary care physician and just say, you know what? You don't even have to feel off balance or feel like you're foggy or, you know, there's a lot of women because the baby boomers are booming. There's a lot of women going through <laughs> menopause now. And that takes your mind to another place that really nobody really explained to you what's going to be happening. So just if we put mental health checkups on our list, make it a just, you know, I'm going to go play sports. So I got to get a physical. I'm going to go to school. So I got to get my shots and a physical, you know, whatever we're doing, I'm going to go travel. So I got to get the shots and I got to get a physical. So mental health needs to be added. No questions asked. Just tell, you know, talk, start with your primary care physician and ask them if they can refer someone. There's, even, there's an assessment that your primary care physician can give you that see that they can kind of assess what, you know, where you are on a, you may not, and you may not need it at all, but you need it, it's like insurance. You only need it when you need it. Because <laughs> if you don't have an accident, you just keep paying it. But yeah. the moment you have that accident, you're gra grateful you had insurance yeah. because it pays 
for that. So just keep that. It's not saying, because it, it has nothing to do with being crazy. We need to take that dialogue, yeah. that word out of our vernacular. Because it's nothing about being crazy. It's about being balanced and being the best person that you can be. Yes, and absolutely. In your life. <laughs> yes. And that was another eye opener for me, the mental health checkup, uh, mm -hmm. as well as the physical and doing it annually that I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. We do have a question from um, a listener. Um, and they says a great point on destigmatizing mental health wellness. And it's great what you all are doing. Do you find more support for the member of faith community being more responsive to change? Or do you find that there's a resistance when you talk about the stigma of um, mental health? And, and then the, uh, the extra was why? And either okay. one of you can. I'll let you take that, April. Okay, great. Um, one of the things that we found to be most important is starting with the buy-in of the leadership. And when we have the buy-in of the leadership, uh, that takes a lot of that burden away from congregants and people signing up for the course because their leadership has their ear and their trust. And it's a, it's a huge deal for the leadership to, to first learn who we are because they're responsible for their flock. And so by having connections and the relationships that Ms. Phyllis has built previously and all of us through our programming with leadership of different churches and networking, um, that has been what we found to be supportive where they get to know who we are and that we're who we say we are and that their discernment allows us to come in. So starting with the leadership is one of the most important things in terms of um, not having resistance to the messaging that we're bringing into the church. And so um, we've had incredible leaders and incredible partnerships across both Riverside and San Bernardino counties so far that have opened the doors um, to, to Healthy Heritage. Again, that's how I got here, was through our pastor, Pastor Terry Starks, who opened the doors to Healthy Heritage and allowed, you know, allowed Ms. Phyllis to come in and to bring the information. So really bringing and, and fostering those relationships with, with the leadership has, has really helped with that. I, I like that you said that. That makes total sense because you get the buy-in of the leadership and then you have somebody that's struggling and they go for counsel um, with the pastor or somebody there. Um, the next step of referring someone and saying, you know, we're going to pray, but also, you know, just like you would do for something physical. So having that leadership buy-in makes absolute sense. Um, and I bet in some ways, and I don't know, um, probably a lot of times the leadership welcomes it because they're dealing with um, congregants that are having emotional challenges that they can't really speak to. So I'm imagining that's the case, that they're very welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've had, like I said, great, um, you know, pastors and bishops and, and first ladies and, and health ministry leaders who understand the importance. And it, once they share the message and have, you know, scriptural background to talk about different things, such as, you know, we're, we're stewards over our body. You know, we're called to to use our gifting that God has given us. And part of that, to be able to do that is to be okay in our mind, body, and Have spirit. And healthy mind. Yeah. And he healthy mind. So in stewarding according to the word, and they're able to help to tie those, those parts together, yeah. that really opens the doors. And another thing that's important is when we talk to the leadership, we really work diligently to... Uh, articulate the vision of the program, but also Ms. Phyllis works really hard with our partners to make sure that the resources are free 
to the churches. Yeah. So when we're coming, we're asking for access, but we're making sure to leave them better and to equip them. And it's not a one-time program and we're gone. We're, we're fostering relationships. We want to make sure to equip and, and empower so that once the program is over, you know, the whoever the health ministry leader is or whoever um, the leadership is within that church, we can still partner with them and still have a funnel to funnel information to them. If they need information or resources, they can come to us. If we don't have it, then we reach out to our network. So it's a, it's a partnership that we're building. And when the churches and the leadership understand that, that we're, we're looking to give more than what I guess we're taking. And that's, that's very important to yeah. have that genuine heart to do that. Um, I think it, it, it turns, to, turns out to be a win-win. Um, and, and that kind of segues into the next question, which is when you go into church, do you train them to empower them to continue this work? That's the first part of that. And um, it sounds like you do, but I'll let you speak to that. And then we'll go to the second part of the question. Okay, I'll take the first part of the question. Okay. Um, thank you for the young lady that uh, asked this question. Yes, when we go, when we select a church, we have to make sure that the capacity is there to provide the um, the items that we need to provide a um, a program. And that usually is someone that's going to take care, that's going to be the point person for the health ministry leadership and a team and a facility, a, you know, a room or whether it's the main sanctuary or classroom, children's church, wherever. So, yes. And then we, we, um, work with them closely in implementing the program because we have several programs. So it could be mental health. It could be living life on purpose. It could be our um, cost of beauty, which is our hair chemical pro could be whatever, whichever program we offer. And yes, we empower them to, um, so we train them who, and it, and it, and they're being trained by whoever is leading that particular program. And it's usually a professional. It's not necessarily us as the team, but like our mental health is a psychologist. Our um, chemical it, uh, program is, a re is our researchers. Our um, living life on purpose is is uh, their chefs and their nutritionists and their and everybody's certified. They're usually at the master's and doctoral level, and they train and work with the um, the leaders of the church that will be heading the project. Yes, it, it was, was interesting. Question. Thank you. When I, um, when I heard about it, I saw the advertisement, I saw the card and I was like, hmm, I don't know what this is. I had a question and I had a friend who said, hey, have you heard about this? It's professional. It's, um, you're going to be, uh, get good information because you never know. And you're absolutely right. It, it met and, and went beyond my expectations as far right. as getting professional information. Right. Oh my goodness. And getting mm -hmm. that guidance. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second question is, does your organization provide services to non-Christian um, or religious organizations? So um, secular organizations. Right. And I will, um, I'll take this as well, April. Um, yes, and it, but it, it depends on the circumstance. Um, it depends on which program they're interested in and which program we have available at that time. But yes, because we go into the community, we go, you know, we'll go into community centers. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we do health, you know, when all this was real <laughs> before yeah. pandemic, you know, when we could do all this, we, yes, we were everywhere. So yes, we do. And um, the program that we're speaking about right now is specifically, um, 
uh, broken crayon still color. This was offered in the faith-based community, but it is, it is it, hopefully we're working to eventually offer it in other places as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Hopefully mm -hmm. that, um, oh, okay. Um, so talking about uh, some of the things that I learned about were the, the signs of depression, um, PTSD, um, eating disorders. Um, but I was really, what really got me was PTSS because we had experienced George Floyd and I have been, I'm still recovering from George Floyd. I'm still working for a while. I totally shut down. Um, didn't know what to write as far as poetry or, or anything of that nature. And I'm still working through that process. I'm going to talk a little bit about the poetry. Um, but what made, uh, you know, I know Broken Crayons is this huge um, mental health services, um, but PTSS, um, talking about the community um, that's you and you show a video that just got me going that I was just like everybody needs to see this video um, what made you guys decide that this was an important element to include um, in talking about mental health so for I'll let you take that in. okay <laughs> so for those who don't know the PTSS that Miss Romaine is speaking of is post-traumatic slave syndrome, correct, that she was referring to in one of our, the films that were shown. And we have to give credit to uh, Dr. Gloria Morrow, I believe, who wrote the curriculum for the course. And um, she is a world-renowned, you know, author and psychologist and, you know, just the, her ability to partner with Miss Phyllis to write the curriculum for this program in carrying out the vision of, um, you know, the funding opportunity that we received for this, this particular grant, I think that's huge. And uh, with Dr. Gloria Morrow and uh, again with Ms. Phyllis and being able to craft the eight week program and really taking everyone on a journey from week one through week eight, where we have graduation and like you said we won't tell too much <laughs> we want people to make sure to to come on in but i think that's a definitely important to to note and that um you know watching the news and watching what's happening we don't know that we can ill you know stress and we could have a ptsd uh, reaction from seeing something happening to someone else. Yeah. And it, it was important to, especially during COVID time and, you know, with, with, with what happened to Mr. Floyd, it, having to turn off the TV sometimes and disconnect yeah. and being able to process and having the tools from this class, I thank God for that, to be able to really, I would say, not just survive, but to, to still be able to thrive despite what was happening. And um, like, like you mentioned with the PTSS, the post-traumatic slave syndrome, you know, we're, we're, we're not that many generations away from, you know, from slavery and June will be celebrating Juneteenth. Yes. We're not that many generations away. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, that really spoke to me and hearing it. I encourage all of the, Romaine, I would encourage all the listeners to um, Google PTSS. And if it's not, the acronym isn't in there, then um, maybe they can spell it syndrome. out. Yes, Dr. DeGrary. And when yes, you, and I had actually, I have to do it. <laughs> there you go. There, there. <laughs> yeah, I have the book. Oh, mm -hmm. you can barely see it. It's Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Post. Joy Degree. Mm -hmm. And um, I had actually read the book before I went to um, 
Broken Crayons Healthy Heritage Movement. Um, but I just read it, you know, and I put it on the shelf. I was like, oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. and it, but then again, having it in context, it allowed me to say, okay, the way that I feel about this this is what PTSS is. I understood it, taking it from mm -hmm. the text and then from the lived experience and then it being destigmatized as I'm not overreacting and I'm not um, too emotional, that it is valid what I am experiencing physically, mentally, emotionally. So that was the, you know, so even reading the book or um, trying to see, I, that's the thing I don't like about the green screen. Um, from reading the book or even watching it on YouTube to having real people conversations about right. it um, made a world of difference. Um, let's see, here's another question. That's why I think uh, each individual should look it up themselves because it, it affects, it is, whether you think it or not, and I'm speaking to the public, it is affecting your life. If you're Black or African descent, living in America. So just get your own context of how it is, how it is affecting your mental health. Yeah. So just, yes, instead of us telling them what it is, yeah, let them look it up themselves and go for it. Yes. And um, actually, <laughs> This isn't as much a question as it is um, an appreciation, a comment of appreciation, saying thank you for your diligence surrounding mental health being, because it's such a taboo in the African-American community um, about receiving treatment um, uh, or medications. Um, you know, to disregard uh, as an accident. I, I believe that's what um, it's it, the rest of that is saying. Um, thank you for taking it from, um, you know, to breaking that taboo. I believe that's what this is. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I love that it started with um, I'm sorry that you lost your mom and, and you wanted to educate uh, us um, and it started with the physical and then the questioning and going to the mental health, but you didn't stop. A lot of people might have met resistance and said, okay, I'm just going to stay with the physical, but you didn't stop. What made both of you decide, um, despite maybe misunderstandings or the stigma or the taboo that we're going to continue on with this? Thank you, Kiana, for that mess, that, that great question. <laughs> um, I, I just realized when I, because really after I lost my mom, I was traumatized and I kind of went rogue for like 10 years <laughs> mm -hmm. and maybe yeah. came back yeah. and, um, and figured out, okay, let's make some changes. And I did. And um, so that's what I think we all need to do. And I think the next major change is that we have to be given permission. And I'm giving whomever is listening um, permission. We need to think about our mind and how we are consuming information and how it's affecting us because I know that when um, my stress level went up in business, so did my health risks mm -hmm. go up. So we, I'm, I'm giving everyone permission that they are connected. Your arms are not disconnected from your torso. Your head is not disconnected from your torso. Your bottom, below your waist is not disconnected we're all the same your brain and guess what that brain if your engine goes out in your car what does your what does your engine do what does your car do does nothing. it move does it go it does nothing this is your engine yeah. your brain is your engine so we got to feed it take care of it nourish it um uh hybrid, you know, make it um, 
give it water. Why can't I think of that word? <laughs> it's hybrid. It's so oh, hybrid. hybrid. <laughs> check the oil. It's check the, do that um, annual check you were talking about. How we take exactly. our exactly. That's yeah. the mental yeah. health checkup. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and then it's all. And then if we if you feel off balance, then you you know go go get another report, but. Don't wait until it makes you feel um, crisis. Yeah. that you can't, like it becomes a crisis, like you can't deal with it anymore. Yes. And so I, we take baby steps. It's not being, you know, like, you know, they used to say Christians are boring. I don't want to be a Christian because I'm going to be bored in life. <laughs> <laughs> that is not true. No. <laughs> listen, if I, if I may speak to that too, listen. I, I tell when you talk, you asked a question about resistance in this program. I, I I I took a picture of the Wakanda soldiers, the ladies and their gear, and uh -huh. I printed, I put it on our office door with the <laughs> Ephesians six on there. Oh, we I love fight that. Our, against oh, those I love that. Yes, we 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 have to put our armor on. Armor so on. it's it's still in the office, <laughs> but. You that know, is that, awesome. Oh, yeah, yes, we, we have to remember in that resistance, you know, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against exactly. spirits and principalities of this dark world. And so when we put our armor on and we're praying and we're getting, you know, in the spirit, we're battling in the spirit for us. We're battling in the spirit for women who we've yet to meet in preparation for the programs. It, it's it's mm. when we get into the room and we see the faces, we know this is what those battles were for. Mm -hmm. This is what the, you know, whatever it is that we had, you know, we, we have to do to prepare for these courses. That is what that is for. And so I, I needed, a, I'm a visual learner. <laughs> so I said, okay, we have those Wakanda ladies with mm -hmm. their red yeah. on and their costumes and and with that scripture, you know, Ephesians 6, and it just, that reminder, when you go out, you put that, put that armor on, put that um, armor on. Miss April, I love that you said that now that visual is so <laughs> in my head, I'm going to print it out. <laughs> um, and, you know, when we talk about crises, we do have another question we'll get to in just a minute. But when we talk about crises and moving past taboos and stigmas, I like that you, I was having a conversation with my son earlier and um, we were watching something on cults and I said, you know, I teach seniors and I educate them through the literature about cults and how they kind of prey on um, students because you're in a very vulnerable position and you are impacted by a lot of things. And you said when you came out of college, you realized I, that, that's a very destabilizing time in one's life. You're, you're learning more. You're coming out of that cocoon of high school where you know everybody, and then you're thrust into a totally different environment. And somewhere along the line, usually there's a, a moment of reckoning. And sometimes it's deep and other times it's just uh, a ripple, but it's there. And so I like that you as a young person, you're speaking to reaching out, you know, when you realize things aren't the way I want them to be for me. And um, do you have any, anything else you want to say, especially about um, things that might be, oh, I need to go talk to somebody or I might need something more that you might have seen um, with either fellow uh, young people or yourself. Do you have anything to say to that? Absolutely. <laughs> I think what I would definitely tell my younger self and younger people now is you don't have to have it figured out. You know, I think there's a perception that the path to success is this straight road and when you hit a, a bump in the road for the first time, if you never really, you know, faced failure, faced challenges, it can think, oh man, what did I do wrong? And there could be this perception, especially now with social media and all of these things where it's the highlight reel of people's lives. And you think, oh man, 
you know, in reality, I'm going through this, but I see their life over there. What am I doing wrong? Mm. And what I will say is life happens to everybody. And when it happens, uh, it's, it's okay. And to have conversations, you know, find, you know, family or friends or someone who has had experience of where you're going. I think one of the things that I've learned, especially during the pandemic, is there's been a convergence of um, information, you know, with, I say, the technology world with us as the younger ones. We have technology. We have information at our fingertips. But the generations before us have experience. They have infrastructure. They have lived experience that is relevant. And you can have information, but the application of information in theory, which you learn in school, is different than in life. Yeah. So I would say not to dismiss your, you know, either that uncle or the parent or whoever it is. It's always telling you something that you didn't want to hear. <laughs> Go back to that person. We all probably have someone who's always you know, trying to tell us something, go back to them. And when you fall, say, hey, you know what? How do, how can I get back up? Yes. And talk to different people because so many people have lived experience. And what I found in is talking and asking questions to people. So many people were willing to tell me how, when they fell, how they got back up. And it was up to me to filter try it on it's like a sweater you get on christmas morning you try it on if it fits you wear it and if it doesn't fit you put it in a box (laughs) and i think that's what's hard for younger people sometimes they feel like people want to tell them what to do or to make them do something and it doesn't have to be that if someone gives you advice and it may not be for you you could say thank you but to listen and there's wisdom in that and and that's one of the things that i found and that's one of the things i would tell the younger generation is that life happens to us all (laughs) and make sure to reach out to those who have lived experience to listen to where they've been because they've probably been somewhere that you've been before despite the information and technology that we have at our fingertips. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. (laughs) I think a lot of- I would like to add is failure is growth. Yes. You, you cannot go through life without fail. Failure is growth. So we have packaged failure as being the worst thing that ever can happen. It is growth. You, we fall down, we get up. You just continue. You just go continue to do what you're doing. We had another uh, question in the Q and A. Okay. Um, let's see, make sure, is that the one, um, let's see, I'll just read it. It's under Kiana Kiana Files, okay, um, it it says, this is actually kismet, Kismet, he made made sure I saw my friend, my nails are too long, the question was, (laughs) with mental health being such a taboo with our people of color, what one thing can a family or community member do with their home to start a dialogue of healing? That's an excellent question. That is an excellent question. That's why I didn't want to. And I'm going to give my perspective, but it would really be something that I would turn over to my um, my psychologist. Yeah. But it is, but in because this is prevalent in our families, in our community. You know, lack of communication, um, you know, a little bit more turmoil and give and take and jealousy, you know, and I know it's in all cultures, but in our culture, when we get mad, we get mad and we don't speak for a while. Mm -hmm. And that kind of eliminates, um, you know, some, it eliminates trust, it eliminates, it sparks other reactions. So we all know we like Sunday dinner, Sunday after church dinners. <laughs> so my recommendation, if there's somebody you really, really, it's like an Ivana, um, 
Van Zandt's, you know, kind of oh, situation. Ian, you you I, I can't. Ianla, Ianla, yes, yes. Miss Van Zandt. Um, get in a in in the same room together. Do it over food. Like it didn't have to be Sunday, but you know the Sunday dinner, the comfort food that we like that makes us feel good. And then just invite whomever that person is in your family and just say, you know what, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about this before it goes further. And um, you know, make sure there's some some apologies in the conversation and make sure there has to be active listening. It you, the person that is that you feel hurt by. You need to tell them why you feel hurt. And then the person that you feel hurt you, then you need to ask them why this situation happened. And usually it's over stuff and things that really don't matter, yeah. but you're still family and you, and you still love each other and you still do anything to protect each other so that's what has to come to the forefront. And you just have to be the bigger person to speak to it. I know it's hard. I know in our community, it's hard. I am talking to her. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But we, you know, we have to stop that because we need to, we need each other. there's enough people taking us out. We can't do that to ourselves. Yes, yes. We do need each other and we do need to, um, that priority, what matters most. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. If the that things was... you can't get back, it's like family. And it's like, when they're gone, they're gone. I mean, do you think over five, almost a, over a half a million people died from COVID? You, they, it was not on their calendar to die. Right. It and... wasn't an appointment. They just up and died because they got sick. So everything they wanted to say and everything someone wanted to say to them, they didn't it's have gone. The and you then when gotta... we talked about COVID, it hit the African-American community really hard. So that's something. And, and you talked about how health issues it's really chronic, hit us hard. Chronic diseases, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's the lifestyle, the chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, um, heart disease. Um, can't think of any high blood pressure, <laughs> high blood. Oh my gosh, hypertension. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Those oh. are the things that you know, COVID is a respiratory disease, so it hits you. When it hits you bad, it hits you right in the lungs. You can't breathe. And then the lungs is response, it's the air wave. It's you know, it's it sends everything else yes. to your yes. brain and to your heart and get your keep your blood pumping. And so we it's all we're not disconnected. That's what I don't think the medical community they, they if, don't if tell, had, they, they yeah. don't let us know. We're not just everything is connected from yeah. your like my southern dad said from the rooter to the tutor it's from the top <laughs> to the bottom we're all connected yeah. <laughs> everything. Yeah. and then you talk about um i have a friend who's a long hauler from covid um which is a whole nother um layer of mental health when you talk about the strain and the stress on the family. And this goes back to Kiana has a follow-up with that. And she says, I think I better get the psychologist, but as the primary caretaker of both our parents, one was severe, I don't know what CHF is and Alzheimer's. No one wants to come and listen to the next step for our father who's 85 years old. So when you talk about long-term health issues 
and dealing with that and the stress and the strain of that on top of everything else um, and dealing with that within the context of family. Definitely, it's not just a matter for the medical doctor, but it would be something that you would want to maybe get um, help and support and wisdom from an objective listener. And that would be a mental health provider that could that could add, um, I'm imagining I'm filling in here and I should let you guys answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I think definitely one thing that has been, uh, that has opened up over through COVID is uh, the availability of mental health providers online, which wasn't necessarily as easy or prevalent during COVID. I mean, prior to COVID, but with, you know, with COVID, um, a lot of providers have been able to open up opportunities through through online and video, which can also help. Did you want to um, speak to um, Kiana about this question? Because I just started flowing with it, but um, Ms. Phyllis, would you like to address that? Okay, the um, one about her... Um... The long term with Alzheimer's, and Alzheimer's and CF, CHF. I, I'm not really sure about what that is, but um, I don't know if this is Kiana or Kismic. I will um, I will refer you to someone regarding Alzheimer's. Is this the same? Is Kiana? Miles. Okay, so one has CHF and then one has Alzheimer's. Oh. Okay. Yes, it's two, it's both parents. Okay, so um, I would like to um, just send some referrals to you. Oh, congestive heart failure. It's kismet, congestive oh, heart failure. Oh boy, okay, okay, got it. Okay. I would like to re um, send referrals. Thank you. And I don't want to answer it live. Yes. And that okay. and that speaks to what somebody else asked earlier. I think it was Ginger who asked, um, no, I'm not sure who it was, um, who asked about um ongoing, you know, do you just come in and do it or do you basically empower their people empowered that can help? And I see you even right now saying I'm going to offer you a referral so that it's not just something you know, that stays there, you're going to um, reach out to that person. So thank you. Thank you for to the a professional, exactly yeah. a professional that knows that area. And I do, um, and in answer to Ginger's question about, I, I did mention earlier, yes, we, we will, we do, we can, and we will go out after all of this is over. We are in the community. And that's where we prefer, but we haven't been over a year unless, you know, because we've put everything online. But yes, and we, and it doesn't have to be a faith-based organization. We just have to make sure that everything's a good fit. And all, so what you need to do is call us, contact us, go to our website and, Thank you. and we'll see what we can do. We're coming close to our time. I wanted to share a poem. I know poetry was incorporated in um, the eight week program. And what I would like to do um, is for the listeners, if anybody uh, does poetry, writes essays, does art, and um, you've been impacted or you know somebody that's impacted by mental health, um, feel free to write and there's a submittable um, that Inlandia has where you can submit it. Um, and we can possibly, if we get enough people, we'll have a collection of, um, as a response to mental health. I want to share, and I debated about which poem to share. And this isn't my own poetry. I have one by Audre Lord, and one by Tracy K. Smith, who was a, um, our poet laureate, poet laureate, yeah, um, a national poet laureate um, a couple of years ago. I, but the one that's still ministering to me is a litany for survival. So that's the poem I'm going to read just as an idea of a response to a challenge. Um, and then know that 
I'm still working on my own poems in response to mental health, and I'm going to submit. And I hope that uh, the listeners there will submit your own writing, uh, um, essays, poems, short stories. If you're a visual artist, you can submit art. So here goes a litany for survival, and then we'll close out with final comments. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone. For those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us who were imprinted with fear, like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hoped to silence us. For all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. So that has been getting me through <laughs> ever since George Floyd. I can't tell you the number of times I have read that. And um, I'm just now starting to crack the shell to write about my own process, but um, that's a springboard. That is um, poet Audre Lorde, and um, that's the springboard. Please write and share your writing. There is a submittable um, on the Inlandia website, and it'll be up there, I think, until um, I know going through the month of June. So um, I look forward to reading your writing, your essays, seeing um, your responses to mental health in the community. So that would be great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Is Audrey, is, 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 she, is, it, is she the young lady, the young girl? Uh, no, 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 no. Audrey Lord is, um, She's, she name. doesn't live anymore. She's, she's deceased. Um, okay. She's just a well-known poet. So it's not Gorman. Uh, that's okay, that's one. Yes, okay, yes. <laughs> no, this is a different poet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for asking that though. Mm -hmm. So everybody that can- That was beautiful. That was yes. beautifully read. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Um, so we're coming near the end of our time. Um, it's been wonderful as it always is in talking with you. Um, I think we have another question here. What an insightful reflection of truth. <laughs> Thank you, Kiana. Um, and I look forward to especially reading something from Kiana because um, you've been an active participant in this um, and Ginger and some of the other people that have had questions. Um, as we come near the end of our time, I think we only have a few minutes left. Um, what parting uh, thoughts would you like to leave our listeners with? Well, I would like to um, thank um, CRDP, which is California Reducing Disparities Project for honoring us with the opportunity and funding us to put this program on, Broken Crayon Still Color, and um, 
colors in African-American churches and inland empires. So San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Um, hopefully in the fall, we'll be able to open it up to some other counties. We will be um, taking uh, registrations for the fall classes on our website, which April will give to you. And um, I just want to thank them and I want to thank the Office of um, Health Equity and the California Department of Public Health for being wonderful, wonderful partners on this program. Thank you. Thank and you. April, would you like, do you have a parting word? I know you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Romaine for this opportunity and in Landia and for just, it's been a great, great, great journey and took us a while to get here, but we're excited to be here for those who are listening. If you would like to sign up for future classes, you can go to brokencrayonsproject.com and at the top of our page, you can click sign up for future classes. And once we have open registration for the next set of classes. You'll be able to join the class, join the conversation. It's wonderful. I am a project coordinator, but I'm also a student <laughs> as well. And you just, we don't know what we don't know, but it's okay not to be okay. And so with that being said, we just give everyone permission to check in with yourself and to take the steps necessary to be okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the classes are online, so you can be located anywhere. You don't have to come to a physical location. Not for fall, even not for fall. It'll still be online. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's yeah. good to know. Um, um, I have one more. Oh, there's one more question. question. I guess we have a little bit more time. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was a, a comment, not a, a question. Thank you so much. Um, another question I have, though, is you're going to be online through fall. Even after things open up, will you um, have a component that is online that will reach out further as well as one that is in person? Okay, I'm multitask. Oh, it, it will be it it will be in the starting the fall. You'll have we both. Are, we yes, because uh -huh. in, in the summer we kind of um, reallocate our resources to another aspect of the program, and then we start we prepare for our September classes, okay. which we um, will probably hold two, and then it'll be you know eight weeks into September and then we'll hold another one. We usually stop right before Thanksgiving. Okay. And then we go dark, dark for the holidays, yes. Is, I didn't register last time because it said you must attend all the sessions. Is that still the case? Yes. Okay. In order yes. to graduate, yes, that's still the case, yes. Okay. And when, when we announce the next class, um, the day of the week will, be announced at that time. So like our last, our previous class was on a Tuesday night, our current class is on a Saturday morning. So it will vary depending on um, which church we're partnering with for the program, what day of the week it will take place. So I would encourage people to still sign up on the list. So when the class, when the class is available, if it's not that particular one, you can just keep listening for your opportunity. We've had that happen with quite a few people who let us know, especially when we were able to shift the program to online that, you know, it opened up opportunity for them. So I would say, keep your ears open. And you never know. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we're going to turn it back now over to um, Ms. Katie Porter if she is there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So thank you all, Romaine and April and Phyllis. Um, this was really informative for me. And uh, if anybody uh, was listening and didn't catch any of the links, 
um, feel free to write to us uh, at in inlandia at inlandiainstitute.org and we can send those out to you individually. Um, I just want to also say thank you to our funding partners, the California Arts Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. And we are just very proud to be able to uh, bring these ladies here and talk to you uh, today. We have um, our two more Blacklandia events coming up on June 13th. Nikia Cheney, who is a past Inlandia Literary Laureate, uh, will be in conversation with Lisa Henry, who is the chair of the Black Voices Steering Committee, and they'll be discussing Afrofuturism and the arts. And then on June 17th, we will bring Romaine back and she will be in conversation with two fabulous artists, Charles Bibbs and Richard Allen May III. So uh, do follow us on social media or uh, go to our website and stay in touch. And we thank you all for being here today. And we look forward to meeting you here again in this space again in the future. So thank, thank you. you. And everybody have a great day. Thank have you. Thank you. Enjoy. Happy holiday. <laughs> yes. Tomorrow. Enjoy this. Yes. Happy weather. Memorial Day. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> bye, okay. bye bye. Bye bye.